Thank you for joining. My name is Emily Constantino, Engagement Manager at MXD. MXD Manufacturing Times Digital is where innovative manufacturers go to forge their futures. In partnership with the Department of Defense, MXD equips U.S. factories with the digital tools, cybersecurity, and workforce expertise needed to begin building every part better than the last. As a result, our more than 300 partners increase their productivity, win more business, and strengthen U.S. manufacturing. We will be recording this webinar, and the full recording will be made available on MXD's webinar library in the coming weeks. If you experience any technical difficulties or would like to communicate with MXD staff or fellow attendees, please use the chat box in your GoToWebinar panel. In addition, we will have a dedicated Q&A segment at the end of our agenda today, but please feel free to submit your questions to the question box throughout the webinar. During the Q&A segment, please feel free to use the raise your hand function to ask your questions verbally as well. And finally, keep up with MXD by following us on our social media. Find the latest news, events, and updates from MXD on our LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And now I will introduce our moderator, MXD's president and CTO, Federico Chimarella. Today, Federico will present an overview of the current supply chain environment and show a demonstration of our supply chain risk alert tool. Thank you, and I will hand it over to Federico. Thanks, Emily, and hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well out there in, in virtual land. We're so excited to have you join us today to discuss this important topic of supply chain disruptions. You know, MXD has been focused on supply chain from its inception. We've actually funded 12 projects to date, including our first supply chain risk alert back in 2017, where from that project, the time from event detection to notification of risk severity and mitigation options was less than a few minutes, where the baseline when they started was about two to five days. As a result, in response to the challenges that we faced here in the US during the pandemic, MXD submitted and was awarded an additional funding research, about $6 million, to address public health and infrastructure needs to support manufacturing as it mobilized in response to COVID-19. And that's this new SCRA, so Supply Chain Risk Alert 2. Yes, very innovative name. Uh, COVID-19, as we know, exacerbated supply chain disruptions, making the need for connected supply chains even more urgent. In response, MXD with key partners developed a tool to achieve three goals. First, we wanted to implement a flexible platform for secure data exchange. Next, we wanted to ensure we could connect multiple public and private data sources to the supply chain map. And finally, we wanted to leverage AI and advanced analytics to predict future supply chain risk. So where do we stand today? If we go to the next slide, um, we'll talk about that. Um, I don't think anyone be, be would be surprised if I told you today that prices to ship goods from Canada to the U.S. on the spot market for standard heavy-duty trucks has jumped 44% from June to February, and even the rate of refrigerated trucks rose by a third over that same period. But what if you um, what if you knew that this could might happen before it did? How valuable would that be to you? Back in March of 2021, it was reported that 40%, only 40% of global freight transport actually arrived on schedule. This is far behind the reliability levels that we had a few years prior to that, where it was around 70%. And I learned that it actually takes 14 days to sh um, sh sail from Shanghai to Los Angeles. Today, it's taking about 33 days. So you're spending twice the time really waiting around to unload at the San Pedro Bay. Before the pandemic, this was absolutely unheard of. So while the ship container um, queuing is going down in the port of LA um, from its peak back in December, the cost obviously also has been very high. So that's been around $6,000, so up about 35% from the start of last year and about 230% higher than that same period back in 2020. So as you see in the slide here in the bottom, 
uh, as the economist said in 2021, this era of predictable unpredictability is not going away. This is why we need to have advanced tools to help us achieve sustainability in the long run. If we go to the next slide, here is where we can see the typical journey uh, for semiconductors for smart smartphones. This really allows us to visually understand where this complexity in the supply chains and problems come in. No doubt we've known that quarantines and social distancing have uh, effectively taken a large chunk out of the workforce, out of commission, especially those responsible for the procurement of raw materials and those who carry out the manufacturing processes. In the next slide, what we're showing is some work from McKinsey that shows the pandemics have had, as we would expect, major impact on labor-intensive value chains. As we're seeing in this current crisis, demand is plummeted for non-essential goods and travel, hitting companies in apparel, petroleum products, and aerospace. So no doubt, as we see here in the next slide, that executives are really feeling the heat. Pressures uh, are mounting as they want to supply these uh, supply chain issues, and they fear for their jobs. Uh, but as we all know, uh, today we're having trouble hiring, right? And there's increased pressures around cybersecurity due to this digitization that we're all uh, undergoing. I think the next uh, slide here also talks about the magnitude that we're facing with regards to the COVID pandemic. Um, and it shows that, uh, according to McKinsey, this could potentially lead to more than $5 trillion in economic loss. As you can see in the US, it's uh, just over 228 million. This impact is gonna be uh, real and it's gonna be felt for some time. Um, in the next slide, I think what we all thought about back in 2020 was this desire to near shore, perhaps increase supplier base, but those aren't really easy things to do and it's really going to take a large concentrated effort to affect this kind of real change. So what happened, Most, mostly people were increasing their inventory of critical products for themselves and their suppliers, which is a good thing and has helped kind of slow down some of the disruptions, but it's a, just a temporary solution. Uh, in the next slide, what I wanted to highlight is this is why it's important perhaps to consider a supply chain risk management program. The benefits of a, this kind of program far outweigh any potential cost to implement and operationalize. Most organizations need to take a step back and ask where they are with their program maturity regarding supply chain planning. The main reason to stay, take this step back is it's really difficult to plan a program when you have not really assessed how mature the organization is with its supply chain and vendor management process. So this supply chain maturity can be looked at uh, in several places. Either you have no SCRM in place, or perhaps you have an informal managed program. Perhaps you have a formal management that's tactical, or really ultimately some sort of formal cross-departmental SCRM program that is strategic. So knowing where your supply chain program sits is really key for understanding how to stay resilient tomorrow. What you're seeing here are some of the benefits of implementing the SCRM program. So we have cost reduction, um, we have cost avoidance. This is generally 7% higher than other competitors that are not using this. Uh, working capital increase, 94% accuracy in terms of cash flow forecasting. That's generally 13% greater than their competitors. Your cash conversion cycle and also Altman score uh, benefit from these kind of programs. So as our colleagues from the Supply Chain Risk Management Consortium will say, to do this, think big, start small, and act fast. So on the next slide, really what we can see here is that still, there still continues to be a lack of visibility in supply chains, um, and really not a lot of technology being utilized, but there is demand. So we know that there's a need, but this uh, is not really easy to do. This is why I'm so excited today to introduce what we've done here with this amazing team and provide a demonstration of the tool that has been developed. So as I said in the next slide, really what we're talking about is thanks to all the previous work done at MXD, early in the COVID pandemic, we had proposed and were awarded this CARES Act funding to develop the Supply Chain Risk Alert 2 project. Again, this project aimed to demonstrate how we could use off-the-shelf commercial solutions to combine them with AI and public data 
to create an open and extensible platform that increases supply chain visibility and identifies risk within your supply chain, giving you a deeper understanding of the lower tiers in your supply chain combined with an early visibility into potential risk that helps shift that supply chain risk management from a reactive process into a proactive experience. Here in the next slide, I just wanted to talk about the project participants. So as a convener here at MXD, we brought together leading solution providers, Coupa and Software AG, along with some innovative startups, RAD360 and Supply Dynamics to the develop, uh, the, for the development of the platform. The Supply Chain Risk Management Consortium shared their profound experience of supply chain risk management to help guide the platform creation and a developed supply chain risk and resiliency playbook that we are gonna to use to educate suppliers on what best practices they can adopt within their organizations. Certainly this project wouldn't be possible without our pilots to actually test this out. So Dow, the Defense Logistics Agency, GeoBit, Lockheed Martin and Oshkosh helped guide the platform's design and are now actually testing the solution against their supply chain to improve the current solution and guide future development. I obviously would be remiss if I did not call out our very own Ramina Lara, who has done a great job PMing this project. Let's go to the next slide. Here's where I wanna show you the Scraw platform, which has a rich feature set. And today during uh, the demo, you'll see only a small portion of what it can offer. So I just wanted to share some uh, behind the scenes information to help you better understand what you're gonna see. At the heart of the Scraw uh, platform is Software AG's web methods platform. This cloud-based platform manages all data movement within the platform. All the tools you'll see demoed are either pushing data into web methods or pulling data from it. Jared from Supply Dynamics will talk about how the manufacturer's bomb or bill of materials data is ingested and how the SDX tools can help illuminate lower tiers within your supply chain. SDX also pulls third-party data sources such as Silicon Experts and LocalQuest to map lower tier suppliers for your standard parts. Now, Zach from Software AG is going to demonstrate the email alert system and oversight dashboard. Behind the risk alert is a Coupa developed AI engine which leveraged public news, weather, and health data to help identify relevant risks, risk events which, can, which may impact your supply chain at all levels. Once identified, these risk alerts are available to all the tools connected to the platform. Later, Michael from RAD will show you how you can use RAD's environment to dive into the risk event details to really understand the impact on your supply chain and begin to formulate a mitigation plan. What Mike isn't gonna be able to show you in the short demo is the advanced profile-based risk assessment and prioritization features that'll help you understand the total risk picture of your supply chain. Finally, Griffin from Coupa will show you how, your, how their product leverages supply chain digital twins to gain a deeper understanding of the impacts, financial delivery times, and more from that risk event. The Coupa solution allows you to explore multiple what-if scenarios to determine really the best way to mitigate the impacts of current and future supply chain risks. I hope you enjoy this demo. And afterwards, you're gonna be able to ask our panel of experts some questions about the demo and the Scraw project and how this can help increase supply chain illumination and resilience. I'll now turn it over for the video. Today, I'll be going over just the data capture features of our SDX visibility and analytics platform for multi-tier supply chains. In particular, those related to documenting end-tier suppliers, part attributes, and bills of materials. So first, just a little bit of background. So many companies that approach the supply chain mapping process, they approach it very superficially. They map only the tier one level. So they ignore a lot of interactions that are going on much deeper in the supply chain below tier one. And this can be problematic because indented bills of materials that identify all of the uh, material inputs and where they're being sourced from, they're really what determine whether a risk event uh, matters or not. And moreover, since bonds change almost constantly due to sourcing and design changes, unless you can easily maintain the accuracy of that bomb data, supplier and event risk data, then it all becomes meaningless. 
So for that reason, the first step is to get good structured build materials for all the parts and material inputs that are going into a customer's finished product, their equipment, their vehicles, their weapon systems, whatever. So you could invite your tier one suppliers or tier end suppliers to log into SDX and to self-report all that information. That's generally the least popular and the least efficient way to go about it. It's not gonna be uh, very agreeable to the vendors. So if an OEM owns design authority on their product or equipment, Supply Dynamics will use a process called part attribute characterization to quickly, accurately, and inexpensively document part attributes and bills materials by using the OEM's own technical data as a starting point. So this could take the form of an engineering drawing in PDF format, a CAD file, a first article inspection report, or even a simple parts list. Whatever the starting point is, that's where we'll, we'll go with, with part attribute characterization. So once that data has been extracted and transformed such that it adheres to a common naming convention and data taxonomy, it's then loaded into SDX. So to summarize, uh, we perform part attribute characterization if good structured part attributes and bills and materials are unavailable. If that data already exists, we'll simply upload it into SDX. And then lastly, the OEM can then invite their tier one suppliers to log in and to validate things like make-buy relationships, lead times, raw material source supply, and frankly, anything the OEM wants them to validate. So with that background out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and hop right into an instance of SDX and show you what the validation process looks like. So there are three ways to validate. Um, a vendor can validate by individual part, multi-row editor, or a downloadable Excel template. We always strongly encourage vendors to use the multi-row editor, which is what we're gonna be covering today. This tool allows them to validate multiple parts and mass. And so let's pretend that I'm a tier one supplier and that I've been invited by my OEM to validate the components I'm supplying to them. So first, I'm gonna get my filter set here and I'm gonna go ahead and populate my data. And uh, most of the pre-populated data you see here was either collected from part attribute characterization or it was provided by the OEM directly. In the case of the Scrap project, most of it was provided directly by the OEMs. So as the vendor, all I have to do is to review this data and confirm its accuracy, and also fill in gaps where there's missing data. So for instance, for these parts, I'll zoom in a little bit here so you can see better. I have to indicate whether I make this product myself or I purchased it finished from somebody else. Now, the the table is dynamic, so if I say I, I buy it from somebody else, I have to then indicate who I buy it from. And so let's say I buy it from this vendor uh, in Freeport. I can indicate whether I have a, a single or a multi-sourcing relationship. In this case, let's say it's a single source relationship, and then I'll complete and save that off. So the tool is designed to make it simple and easy to validate n mass. Uh, for example, if I have a lot of fields that are all the same, let's say that the lead times are the same across multiple parts, I can simply drag down the same value across all cells like this. It makes it very easy. The validation table also performs what we call referential integrity checks to ensure that only good data is getting in the system. For example, if I'm validating the weight of a product, uh, there's only certain uh, units of measure that are valid entries. So the OEM ensures that uh, what they want to be entered in the system is what actually will be entered. Also, uh, if I want to enter, for example, a product family or subfamily, uh, I can't uh, misspell and enter the wrong nomenclature. So let's just pretend that I've misspelled chemical there. Now that's an invalid entry, so I have to make sure I choose the proper uh, value from what's available. So those are called referential integrity checks, and they ensure that good data is only being entered into the system. It'll also, it's important to note that which fields are required are completely customizable by the OEM who invites the suppliers to validate. So typically that will include things like make by relationships, uh, source of supply, lead times, information about the starting stock. Uh, some customers will collect uh, pricing information or they'll ask the vendor to validate specific material grades, specs, alloys, et cetera. Uh, it really depends on the material in question as well as what the OEM's requirements are when they set up the validation process. So once I fill in all the required fields for this particular part, I can complete validation for it. 
So this requires that I certify my bill of material data is up to date and accurate. So it'll ask me to certify that. So I'll go ahead and hit accept. And now that part is marked as validated, but there are other parts that are still in progress that I have to finish to complete the validation process. So now that OEM who invited me in has uncovered an additional tier of supply that can then be tracked by SDX and the larger SCRA platform. So now I'll turn it over to Software AG to explain how SCRA can help mitigate against risk events that could impact that supplier. So whenever a new risk comes in, an email is sent out to the appropriate individuals. So we're gonna go through how we see this playing out between the SCRA UI and the RAD and Coupa applications. A new risk alert posted. It looks like it would be affecting my Freeport, Texas site. Let's take a look at it on the dashboard. And log in. And oh, new top risk alerts. Hurricane nearing landfall. Let's view it on the map. This must be it here. Looks like it was posted on February 8th around 12 in the afternoon. Severity unknown. Let's see if it's shown as affecting my site. It should be my site here, and it is. And it was a severity unknown, and we can see here it was affecting my site. Uh, let's view more details about this risk alert in RAD. And I would click this to go into the RAD portal, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Loveless with RAD360. Hi, my name is Mike Loveless. I'm with the RAD team, and I'm going to walk us through how the data that you've seen brought through Software AG becomes accessible to the user in the RAD platform. I'm going to start off with that Texas risk alert that was brought up a short while ago, and I will show you in the risk alerts dashboard how a user would access this and be able to interact with it from a risk assessment, risk scenario planning, and mitigation planning perspective. When you're on the, list, the risk alerts page, you have access to date ranges to restrict the information that is showing up in terms of the amount of risk alert information that's been brought into the system. You may search based on key terms or sources. So if I type in Politico, it starts to restrict. If I look at Brussels, you can see it starts to restrict. Uh, we're going to look at the one from Texas. Now, one other thing that you can use for filtering, filtering or sorting, you may mark certain risk alerts that you've already reviewed as being favorites so that you can get back to those quickly. So if I go here and I've got the full list of 1,088, I may click to just those that are favorites as well. I may also view the risk alerts, not just in list view, but also in map view. So those things that have a, a map pin based on a location, I can drill into those and see the locations that have specific risk alerts associated with them. Going back to the favorite alerts, I'm going to grab the one that was mentioned in the previous demonstration for hurricane landfall expected in Texas. Now, the same information that is used over in Coupa is the same information that we use in RAD from a bill of materials supply chain perspective. We receive the information from Coupa that has come from their AI search engine, which is restricting to only bring information through that relates to relevant nodes in the supply chain, either components or locations. And as you can see in the risk alerts detail page, you, the user will be able to benefit from a sentiment analysis of the tone of the article, whether it's positive, neutral, or negative. Also, we'll see the topic or topics which are relevant for the content that's in that article. The user may also click on those external sources that are listed and view them directly. From the story itself, the AI logic is able to identify potentially components and locations that could be affected based on the information that exists in that risk alert news article. The user may certainly add 
more if there are other components or locations that the user is aware would be affected, but that the AI logic didn't necessarily identify out of the content of the story. The user may also override and remove certain locations or components. But based on the components and locations that are involved, the where used functionality in RAD will identify product or products that could be affected based on the impacts identified by AI and user in the supply chain nodes. Based on that, the user can also create risk scenarios that may relate to things that could happen based on the news in the article. And the user can create mitigation plans, which could either be developed in advance for those hypothetical scenarios or against actual issues that are arising from uh, a news story that is not just hypothetical but actually reflects something occurring as an actual event. From any of these uh, parts of the risk alerts detail page, the user can drill into details related to the supply chain nodes either as components or locations and view again the risk alerts that have been connected to those locations, what the highest risks are at component and location level, and view where those things are used. If any mitigations have been created, those will be visible here. And as users create mitigations and scenarios, that information gets transmitted over for Coupa to use in digital twin simulation. At this point, the user having created scenarios and mitigation plans may want to go over and evaluate how that looks in the Coupa system. And so by returning to the dashboard, the user then can proceed to the Coupa system to evaluate and perform digital twin simulation. So at this point, I will hand over to the Coupa team to demonstrate that functionality. So far, we've validated our input data and been notified of a risk alert. Uh, next, I will be showing you the digital twin and network model that we can use to assess the risk and understand the impacts it may have on our network. I can uh, open up my app by going to the App Studio here, and I can select the specific app from the, the list here. Because we are assessing the risk, we can assume that we already have built and validated our baseline model. So we don't need to go into these first three sections here. Instead, we will start with the design risk scenarios section. I can click there and be taken to this screen with my list of scenarios. We already have a scenario created that will shut down this Freeport location because of the hurricane. We can open it by clicking on this button in the bottom right. From here, I can select the scenario from the dropdown and hit OK. When we've selected our scenario, we're taken to the scenario configuration page. This page will allow us to make any changes to the network to reflect what we expect to happen because of the risk. There are a number of levers here that we can pull, including sites, lanes, production, and even customer demand. Today, we only need to use the sites lever to close down the Freeport site. We can see from the map that the Freeport location is colored red, so it has been excluded already. If we wanted to close another location, we could do that in this table on the left using the site status column. For now, we can leave it as is since we only want to exclude the Freeport location. Once we are happy with the scenario, we would go to this run risk scenario button in the top right. This would begin the process of solving the model and after a few minutes of running, we would be taken to the output screen. We'll save the time today because we've already run this beforehand and go to this compare scenarios screen. In the scenario comparison section, we can see that the hurricane has caused, caused us to spend $400,000 more, primarily in production costs. We can also see that we're averaging about 2,500 miles more between sites. We can get a quick, quick glance of what may be happening by taking a look at our network map. Here, we can see the baseline on, or current state on the left-hand side. Products flow directly from Asia into our Freeport location. On the right-hand side, those same products flow from Asia to Brazil to our manufacturing location in West Virginia. We can also use the detailed comparison tab to see exactly where those cost drivers are coming from. 
we've been able to fulfill all of our demand, but that is due to the extra $400,000 in production costs and some minimal increases in transportation costs. If we wanted to get more information about those production costs, we could go to the production tab. Here we can see the differences between a ba the baseline and the scenario again. We can scroll over and see that our scenario costs are driven primarily by this one location. In the immediate time frame, there may not be much we can do about this price increase, but with enough warning and preparation, we can begin to ask and answer some questions about our network. Is there another manufacturer that could produce this for us at a better price? Would they be closer to home? Perhaps the demand doesn't need to be served immediately and maybe we could wait it out. Or maybe we could even bring product in earlier and, and fulfill that demand at an earlier timeline. These questions and more can be explored and answered with the network optimization model that's part of the Scrawl platform. That's all for our demo here today. Thank you for watching. All right. Hopefully that was uh, exciting and entertaining. Uh, I think we're going to get um, our panelists up here, uh, see some questions coming up. So panel, if you could please uh, turn on your cameras to join us. It's the responsible party for, for such a, a great tool. So I welcome everyone. Um, so just want to jump into some questions here. Um, so Trevor, uh, if you could Tell me really what efficiencies you think will be created with a, with a tool like uh, Scraw. Can you talk about that? So, Frederico, this is a really exciting and, frankly, unprecedented project in that it brings together lots of subject matter experts in various areas. You know, I think there's this whole myth of the holistic solution. It, it really hasn't existed. No. And... Uh, all the more reason why uh, it's been terrific that that MXD has sort of served as the super collider, sort of knitting together a bunch of uh, market subject matter experts to create a solution. I, I think the use cases that we see today, uh, certainly for our solution and some of the others that you'll learn you've learned about, are initially simply multi-tier supply chain mapping and visualization, right? Uh, you can't control what you can't see. So everything begins with, with mapping. I think the other use case is really item level detection. So something that goes below the tier one vendor. Uh, you know, If you don't know the tier two, three, and four, or the parts and materials that go into your product, then really event information becomes essentially meaningless because it's not translatable into actionable uh, information. Uh, part material and component forecasting, some of the risk management stuff was obvious in the presentation. Uh, part family classification so that you can group uh, parts and assemblies that require certain manufacturing and special processes and then you can then map those to sources of supply that have those capabilities. And then even things like compliance with sustainability regulatory and trade compliance is a big deal. So calculating local value added and regional value added content of parts coming out of Mexico or Canada, for example. So these are some of the obvious use cases. I think one of the most exciting for us that we see is simply the ability to choreograph interactions across an extended value chain. So th this is commonly referred to as directed by where you get you get an original equipment manufacturer that is directing its end tier suppliers to procure certain common electronic components, chemicals, plastics, or metals from certain sources of supply. I mean, my theory is that in the future, uh, OEMs will act as quarterbacks, sort of choreographing the plays in and among their sub tier suppliers. Great. Great, yeah, that's great. Uh, and I'm just curious because I, I got really excited. Glenn, maybe you can explain uh, how do you build a twin of your of your supply chain? That that was really fascinating. Can you talk maybe a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Great question. So, um, you know, I'll, 
most of the companies that we're talking to or about have a fairly large investment already in planning and execution systems. And uh, the digital twin is just basically extracted and built uh, you know, from that information. So you connect um, the, the digital representation of your supply chain. Um, you know, the term digital twin, I guess, is, is also a highly used term and probably not well understood. Um, maybe misused in a lot of cases. Um, so, you know, Gartner defines it as a dynamic real-time and time phase representation of the various associations between data objects that ultimately make up how your physical supply chain operates. You know, in short, it is a digital representation of your supply chain, but it's a data representation that is designed for a purpose. In this case, the modeling context that we are trying to present here as part of the Coupa solution. Mm -hmm. um, it, we have a standard data model. We map in your information into the data model based on the amount of data you put in there. There are you know dozens of use cases for applying the, the tool that we have uh, from optimization to simulation. Um, it, the longest part of this is building that digital twin, making all those connections and making sure that it's a valid representation. Uh, the next step after you get all the data in there is to build that baseline model of how your supply chain is operating today and you validate the cost and the performance and the movement of product and supplies and make sure that it looks like it's accurate. Before you can do what if, you need to have a baseline to compare to. And then once you have that set up, um, you know, doing some of the things that we just saw in the demo is, is, is very possible and you can test a whole bunch of different things. My background, I'm an Air Force uh, retired colonel and pilot. I, I didn't fly an airplane, didn't operate an airplane until I, I went through the paces in the simulator to understand all the things that could happen, uh, you know, you know, engine fires and the like, and, and you train on how to respond to that thing. So the, the planning you do and the training you do gets you ready for events that are unplanned in real life. And the same. Great. Yeah. And I think that brings another question about this transparency of supply chain. So Greg, if you could tell me what you think the largest cultural shift that needs to be addressed to really pave the way to this supply chain, uh, supply chain transparency that, that we're gonna need for, for tools such as this. Oh, I uh, can't hear you, Greg. Can you try to unmute? All right, um, we'll come back to you uh, here, Greg, in a second. Michael, maybe tell me how you're leveraging AI in these large data sets to pr proactively predict risks. <laughs> you're muted. You might have to click the mic uh, again. There we go, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Said that I was I was muted by the organizer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So great, great question, Federico, and it's it's one that that really uh, taps into a trend that you see a lot in in the technology market these days, where more and more organizations are coming out attempting to apply an AI solution to risk assessment, evaluation, trend prediction. It is a powerful tool. It's exciting where it's headed in the future. It does need to be balanced. As well, AI isn't always needed. Sometimes using analytics along with a specific decision support program logic can do the same function. But in either case, uh, AI or other tool approaches, the goal is still to help project and predict the likelihood of a risk event occurring. And it's especially important today in, in the uh, across organizations and across industries the just-in-time inventory is, is tending to be the, the way to approach things. You're not looking to carry massive uh, safety stocks. In that scenario, the, really the only way to achieve uh, resilience is through proactive analysis and preparation, and AI is part of that. Now, from the standpoint of evaluating external risks, which is what you see a lot of the technologies coming out today do, that's focused on predicting future event occurrences, um, these can also likewise be used to project and analyze event frequencies, uh, cyclicity, seasonality, or contributing or compounding situation factors um, based on your organizational environment. But it's also equally important 
to make sure that you train the same logic, whether it's analytics and uh, program logic or it's AI on your internal enterprise data. Uh, you need to really evaluate from your own databases, data patterns, trends, anomalies that can point to potentially internal triggered risk events, production defects, supplier late deliveries, customer product recalls. Uh, now, as I was saying, AI has become kind of the, if you have a, a hammer, everything to you is a nail, you need to be cautious with the way that you apply AI, that you don't let it be the only mechanism for assessing risk because human understanding of the nuances of your operations, your first person experience, site visits, observation, the knowledge of factors that won't appear in the news or enterprise data are all equally crucial inputs. And so you have to build a system that can learn from user input using machine learning, override behaviors, et cetera, with respect to what the system is proposing so that you don't just go along as if it's a, a roller coaster ride that you don't have, have control over. Uh, to achieve intelligent resilience really requires the blending and balancing of the best of human and machine. And that's where I think that AI has its proper use and that's where the optimized solutions will go in the future. Great, and I think Greg, maybe you fixed the, the problem, so maybe go, come back, because I think that is important. What What is that cultural shift that needs to happen to address yep. this issue of supply chain transparency? You you bet, uh, it's very important. I fought the mute button and I won, finally. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, to us, we've been in this space for 12 years. To us, risk management folks is all about culture, all right? Many companies that we've worked with around the globe, many of them are risk averse and they focus purely on loss control. Other companies are procrastinators and they wait till the very, 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 very last moment to make a decision regarding risk. Still others are very good managers where they're, they know how to balance, as Mike was saying, they know how to balance risk reward. And they have several different tools and techniques to do that. And then finally, there are organizations that are very aggressive and they treat risk not as a negative, but as a positive. They look at risk as an opportunity to grow. So there is no right or wrong answer for the folks on the call. There's no right or wrong answer, but one needs to understand the company's risk appetite before you begin the journey. And I'll reiterate the importance of visibility and transparency again. What you don't know about your supply chains can and will hurt you, especially relating to your risk appetite. So it's both what, what you don't know about your visibility in your supply chain, and if you're not aware of your company's risk appetite, that can and will hurt you. So that's what we've seen. Now, uh, great point. Uh, Mike, you want to add something there real quick? I do. I, I really like Greg's point that it isn't just defensive, it's offensive. And I think that your exemplars with respect to the management handling of supply chain risk management recognize that it is not just for the prevention of risk damages, but it is also opportunistic from a competitive perspective. And we've heard that even in some meetings with uh, some of the other member organizations of MXD that they found that during the pandemic, because they had thought proactively, had developed some potential hypothetical situations, one of which apparently came very close to what happened, they were better able to deal with that and get themselves out of the, uh, the trough of disruption and be able to actually take market share from competitors who mm -hmm. had not taken that time up front. So it changes from being a cost and protective thing to actually being an opportunistic and business development type of a, an asset. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, I don't know if we lost Floyd or just have a, a video issue. Floyd, are you there? Oh, oh hey. All right. uh, Floyd, I just wanted to ask a question here. How do you ensure the platform itself is in a static solution for just today's challenges? Yeah, well, look, I think out of the box. I mean, there's certainly already a lot of great capabilities that are part of the platform. But the types of information we have today may change or the, the methods and the sources may change. Mike even mentioned about making the models smarter over time. So that includes getting additional data and data sources that may play, in, play into that. So what's important to make sure that it's not static is to have that data ingestion layer. In the case of Scraw, that's provided by the web methods integration platform. But 
the, the data ingestion layer, what it does, it abstracts the data and the sources. So for example, the bomb data, vent data that's coming in from the components that use the data, such as RAD and Supply Dynamics and Coupa. And what this really creates is that agile framework. It, you mentioned kind of in the beginning, Federico, that calling it an open and extensible framework. And so what that does then is it allows any new data source now or in the future to be quickly added in a plug and play fashion. Um, the, the data ingestion layer also provides that connectivity to any, any data, because it could be APIs, could be files, could be data lakes, you, you name it. And then it reduces that complexity within the architecture. So what this also means is new capabilities that maybe are envisioned now or added in the future can simply access a common set of APIs within the Squaw platform. Great, thanks. And just more questions coming in. So Trevor, I guess the question here is, is there a way to consolidate part information to get lower cost on your material costs? Yeah, so that has been one of the main use cases of SDX over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what drives behavior is incentive, right? Somebody once said that stakeholder alignment eats strategy for breakfast and <laughs> The, the, the way the way that you want to get alignment is to is, is to make sure there's something in it for everybody and and one of the obvious uh, areas of low-hanging fruit is the opportunity once you can see across an extended value chain is to say hey what are the common material inputs in terms of electronics metals plastics chemicals and just as in a, in, in, in a football game, a quarterback calls the plays and choreographs the activities of the players, now you can get an OEM saying, does it really make sense for uh, you know, 72 of my suppliers to be buy, buying titanium independently? Or would it make sense for me to assist them in procuring common 6-4 titanium from one or a few sources of supply? So what we've seen in the last, you know, even in the last three to five years is we used to say, well, the savings could range between three to 7%. It's not uncommon to see OEMs driving closer to 22 to 25% savings for common material inputs. So I think you've got to look for those opportunities to create what we call stakeholder alignment and create the incentives for transparency and cooperation. Oh, that's great. Um... Yeah, I got a question here, interesting one, so I'll throw it out there, maybe Floyd, if you want to start, but anyone else jump in. So it says, the DOD issued a report yesterday on the state of competition within the defense industrial base. Essentially, there isn't any competition with the consolidation of five major firms. So with a lack of competition, who will drive SCRM for DOD, the contractors or DOD? Whose culture will accept SCRM's role and the incorporation of tools such as MXD? So, uh, Floyd, if you want to take a stab, and then I'll, I'll open it up to, to whoever else. Yeah, yeah certainly that, that opens the changes. Uh, but I think ultimately the, the DOD drives drives a lot of that, right? I mean, they're, they're ultimately who are responsible for it. It affects them. And so I, I think it takes that consolidated effort from the DOD driving that message and that agenda. And then the, the, the industrial base will, will follow suit. I'll, I'll chime in by saying that you have you have a choice sticks or carrots right and and generally you, you want to use both the dod is very good with sticks uh our commercial <laughs> customers are much better at using carrots i think you have to use both so uh, if if i am the dod customer one of the best ways to get my suppliers to be more transparent about their supply chains is to say hey as a condition of purchase you're required to do these things. And I, I don't think the DOD has traditionally asked for that. I think what the DOD has traditionally asked for are other things. Mm -hmm. And I think they're beginning to rethink that equation. Okay. Yeah, I'll, go I'll chime in. I'll chime in. Uh, Trevor, good point. Uh, in fact, uh, what we've seen, uh, most of our clients are commercial manufacturers. What we've seen is, is just what uh, Trevor was talking about, incentives. You know, what's in it for me? And you have to articulate to a manufacturer, uh, from us to them, the benefits to be derived, Federico, that you profiled from us uh, initially in the in this session. 
I think uh, for the DOD and the contractors, I think all of us have more work to do to essentially articulate what's in it for everyone in the complex DOD supply chain. So we, we all have a lot more work to do to demonstrate and articulate what's in it for everyone uh, because as Trevor mentioned, I think it, it's a collaboration. There's gotta be incentives and people need to understand what's in it for me, why we're doing this. And so I, I think uh, we still have a lot of work to do uh, right. in this large uh, supply chain arena. Michael, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, all great points. And I think that uh, one thing that I will add, obviously there are certain agencies <clears throat> which already do require that type of transparency, NASA and Missile Defense Agency among them. Uh, for those that have not required that, it's very difficult to go from zero to 100 all in one shot. So there is an ability to do, to do a crawl, walk, run type of an approach, uh, particularly when you think about it, one of the easiest things to do without them providing the transparency to all of the details of what they're doing you don't need to know what goes into the sausage as long as the quality is good over time you can start to ask for more information but at the very least if you're able to find a way to capture and to consume into your own scrm information about how your suppliers feel they are handling the risks that threaten their operation as long as you have an idea of what they feel their top end risks are how frequently they're hitting them, uh, what of their products could be affected, but without getting into all the details, at least that's something that you could use to start to train your AI searches for external news, that it relates to at least the, the high level things that they're identifying that they're concerned about. That's kind of a small way to get started, but if you're, if you're going from having not captured anything, that may be a relatively low risk way for them to be able to provide that kind of information. Okay, great. Uh, and Glenn, a, a question here from the audience again. Um, do you see an 80-20 rule for these types of technology? I'm assuming the use of these type of technologies, um, uh, if uh, if at all. I mean, I guess, how, or your thoughts on that, maybe. 80-20 um, rule. Trying to understand the context here. Um, yeah, or Dan, uh, whoever, was, I think it was Dan, if you want to. Uh, type in some more uh, to that. Um, if not, we can jump to the next one. I think the. Um, I okay. think the thing I would I would say is, um, you know, in relation to Trevor's carrot and the stick, you know, the application of these technologies to build more resilient and agile supply chains is what's in it for me for for all of the industrial base. Not just we don't need just regulation to tell us to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, all these companies that are part of the solution, we exist because we add value to companies, you know, every day with, you know, that's the carrot, right? There is value in, in going down this path. Having a resilient, agile supply chain uh, it, yeah. is worth it. So he, the, uh, he clarified it, they were say, asking, where do you focus your initial efforts? Is perfection the blocker of progress? Oh, yeah, it <laughs> definitely uh, perfection can be the blocker of progress. But, yeah, start with... Uh, you know, in this particular solution, there are like four levels of data, and for each level, you get a different, you know, like the basic uh, nodes and geographies. You can kind of map out your supply chain and see what it looks like. You can add flows. You can start to add costs. When you get to the cost level, you actually start to have a, a basic functioning digital twin that provides a lot more insight, and then there's other lay layers beyond that. But start small. Start getting insight. Start doing something with it, and yeah, perfection you can pursue that forever, but 80, 20, definitely. Yeah. Go with 80. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? All right. I got an interesting question here. Uh, it says, how can MXD ensure the protection of sensitive multi-tier supplier data, e.g. leveraging AWS GovCloud? Um, any, any takers on that or thoughts? I'm going to share. I'm going to share something that we're very excited about. We're also working with MXD on this project, but we have a project where, for example, if you look at financial stability of a company, it's very much easier to get that kind of information from a publicly traded company that has to disclose certain things publicly, but very difficult, particularly in the aerospace and defense arena, because about 
I would say 70, 60 to 70% of the suppliers are not public, they're privately owned, and therefore subject to much less rigorous financial reporting requirements. So we're working with a, a partner on a project at MXD where uh, we're using virtual vault technology uh, to allow a small or medium-sized company to submit financial information uh, into a virtual vault. It will then perform a credit assessment and basically calculate an Altman Z-score, but it did not require the transfer of that sensitive underlying information to any third party. Now, once the score is calculated, you extract that, uh, and you're able to report on a company's financial stability without requiring them to transfer that sensitive data. So uh, the company's name is Sympatic, and they're a partner on a project that we're working on with MXD. Yep. Uh, I think that's one, it's one very innovative way to handle these sensitivities. The, the other thing that can be done that I think has been very effective is within, within SDX, uh, you're able to do what we call attribute masking. So sometimes the OEM at the top of the food chain doesn't really care about the detailed data. They just want the overall insights that, that Michael was referring to earlier. And so attribute masking can be a very effective way of, of, of uh, incentivizing greater levels of transparency and cooperation. Yeah, and just to kind of bounce off of that or add to that and what Trevor's saying from the, the masking layer, uh, one, certainly running inside of a Gov, GovCloud or secure uh, environment, the, all, all the, the platform can run in there and be secure that way. But even on the access layer or the API layer, being able to provide policies and even mass data so you can apply policies to secure and ensure who can access those APIs and data and even mask out attributes even on the API level. Okay, great. And we've got a couple minutes left here, but I just want a question here, uh, kind of same along lines. Glenn, what are some of the security risks to uh, implementing a supply chain alert tool and how can manufacturers avoid risks, if any? If any? Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's probably greater risk in not trying to implement some sort of scanning tool, um, yep. right? You know the potential risks uh, that are out there can impact your supply chain in so many negative ways. An active scanning system. There's so much news. There's so much noise. Having some kind of AI robot that's going out there scanning and finding things that are relevant to your supply chain is one great way to, to have a proactive active scanning, you know, process. So I would, I would say, change the question a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've got about a minute or so left here. Again, I just want to thank all of you for, for all your efforts and, and work going on here. I know it's not over. We, we've still got some, some way to go, but um, you know, I hope the audience has enjoyed. And if we haven't gotten to your questions, we will get back to you. Um, I know there was also a question about the DOD article that was mentioned. I just read that, so I'm not sure what article that is, but if anyone wants to send it my way, happy to share it with those attendees here. Um, I think at this point, what I'll do is uh, thank you all again and probably turn it back over to Emily to, to close us out. Thanks, everyone. Emily? Yes, I just want to thank everyone for attending this afternoon. This concludes our webinar for the day. Um, we would also like to let you know that if you'd like to keep up with MXD, you can follow us on social media and also subscribe to our chain mail newsletter, a newsletter dedicated to supply chain news and stories. Uh, thank you again to our panelists. We appreciate you so much for uh, attending this afternoon and sharing your insights on the supply chain risk alert tool project and of course to our moderator mxd's president and cto federico shimarella thank you so much have a great afternoon thanks everyone take care thank you Bye. take care